Assalamu alaikum to you all. Can you hear me loudly and clearly? Wa alaikum salam. Yes, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Yes, sir. We do. We're ready to roll. We're ready to get started. We got a lot for you. All right. I'm ready. Let's roll. All right. <laughs> well, uh, praise be to Allah with the last name, last signature, merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. Uh, we just want to welcome everyone uh, to what we anticipate being a very enlightening and elevating evening uh as as always but i just feel a special energy tonight and, uh as you can see in, in in the background uh we, we we've been working we've been busy <laughs> and uh, we're preparing for uh for the future and, and instructor indicated in, in the notes for tonight's class that uh, that'll be he, he'll be giving some attention to that but well, we're, as, as we speak, uh, we've been working on some, uh, some people will call them podcasts, uh, but our numetics description of the same is uh, seed casts. So we've been busy working, putting some ideas and concepts together and actually uh, recording some episodes already. So uh, it's just a word to the wise, get ready. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you learners out there, you instructors, you uh, senior instructors, ex executive senior instructors, it's time to get ready to, to put your, your, your learning uh, not only into practice in your own life uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but get ready to start doing some very serious sharing of the information the laws bless you with. And with that, I'll pass the mic and pass the baton to our, our international instructor, Benjamin Bilal. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum to you all. Glad to have you here. Got a whole bunch of information for you. Need to share it with you. A lot of it is going to be new. So you're going to be developing some new synapses in the brain before tonight is over. But don't let it cause you to have any anxiety or fear. You know, for those of us who have faith, there is no fear, nor is there any grief, no reason to grieve. So I'm going to ask, uh, in fact, I'm going to just mute out all of the callers now. Please do not mute yourselves back in <clears throat> unless there's a very seriously important question that you need to ask or a point of information that you need to have. I am your international instructor, Benjamin Bilal. We're coming to you on this fourth night of December, last month of this calendar year, 2022. We're going to be going into 2023 with a bang, and I'm talking about a linguistic bang the kind that created the universe if you know what i'm talking about because allah has given us a gift for sure and he's given us the gift called nunetics it's the so-called new kid on the block and it's not taking any shorts and it's not allowing any bullies to cause it to leave the block <laughs> If you understand what I'm saying. So we're going to get started today. Boy, we have a subject for you. And as I indicated in the email, this is really a, um, a subject for those of you who are more scientifically inclined. If you're not, don't worry, you know, write down whatever questions or comments you might want to make, and then we'll make them at the end of what it is I need to say. Uh, never be afraid of any scientific concepts. This world of scholarship has actually hidden much of the most precious knowledge in two different areas. I'm going to tell you what those two areas are. The first area is that they have hid some of the most precious concepts for human life and development within scientific $50 word terms. Because they know the average one of you are going to be scared of them and you'll never investigate. And the other term that uh, this world of scholarship especially those who operate as secret societies, et cetera. The other set of words that they have hidden very precious terms and wisdom terms in are cuss words. <laughs> because they know the majority of us. I don't know about today's time, but I know back when I was coming up, we were afraid to cuss. And this was done, trust me when I tell you this, it was done intentionally because these are two areas of linguistics that they knew that the average person in the masses would be particularly afraid of or not familiar with. It'll be one or the other. 
you'll be familiar with cuss words, but not familiar with scientific terms, or you'll be uh, so deeply invested in scientific terms that cuss words won't even be any part of your vocabulary on the most part. So they've hidden, again, the most precious terms in these two areas of language. And believe me when I tell you that the majority of the terminology which exists both in the sciences as well as in the cussing and fussing words actually come out of the Arabic language. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. I, I would simply ask you to just listen to the closeness and sounds of the word Shiite and the, the other word. <laughs> You'll understand what I'm talking about. A lot of you don't know that uh, even in the Quran is a word uh, called fakka. You can associate that with another cuss word, can't you? There's Adam, and one of the most popular words that used to be a cuss word is the word dam. So that comes out of the Bible. But in the Quran, it's the word for blood, dam. Right? They say, you know, G-O-D, damn you, you know. Right? So they knew that our hearts at some points would be just too tender to deal with the cussing and the fussing stuff, especially in front of grown-ups or cultured people. So they hid those terms and they studied those terms in private and in secret with their children and their grandchildren and the grandchildren's children. That's where they study these terms and they say, don't let the outward uh, display of uh, negativity or, or cussing and fussing fool you. We don't wanna use these terms in public, but we want to dig down into the nitty gritty of the meanings of these words while we're here in private so that you'll understand son, grandson, great grandson, grandchild, granddaughter, whoever, how we are actually ruling and manipulating the minds of common people, because that's what it's all about. Trust me when I tell you, you know, the word science itself is related to the word S-H-I-T. You can find that in the online etymology dictionary because there was a time when S-H-I-T was not considered to be a curse word. When it was originally introduced into the English lexicon, it was a word in science that meant science. Now you might say, well, how does such a nasty, disgusting word come to represent science. Well, the SCI in science is the same as the SH in shit. Shall I go a little further? Or should I just close out now and let you guess the rest of the way? <laughs> I'm going to take a bold step forward and continue. And again, this can be substantiated through the online etymology dictionary, the dictionary that you know I always recommend for anyone looking up English words. SH means to separate, as those of you who study Nunetics, you already know that because that's in the Nunetics book under the letter Sheen, S-H-E-E-N, Sheen. It means to separate and to spread out, for, but from a central source. And I know you see it already. It means to separate, take for instance, the Arabic word for the sun, shams, shams. It looks like a circle in the sky, but around the circumference of the circle are rays that come out from the circumference and go in all different kinds of direction, right? Same thing with the sea shore, the English word S-H-O-R-E. It begins at the middle or in the middle of the ocean, and then the waters come into the shore, but they come from a central point in the middle of the ocean, okay? So it's anything that has a central location, whereas the energies or the frequencies from that central location allows for it to go out and spread out into other areas. That's SH. So that's what they saw in the word SHIT. They saw it coming from a central place called the anus. And for those of you who don't know, the word anus is also, as you know, a word in science. But what you might not to know is that it's a word that originally meant light, L-I-G-H-T, light. When you go to your light switch in your house and you flip it up, you're turning the light on. And the word on, O-N, and the word an, A-N, are related words. <clears throat> So the A-N in the word anus or anus means light, meaning something that is coming out of the darkness 
as poop tends to do, <laughs> into the light. I didn't make it up. I'm just explaining to you their uh, weird science and scientific terms and how they derive these particular concepts. All right. So as you know, in the world of uh, Islam, the term Shiite means sect, S-E-C-T, which means that it sectioned itself off from the larger body of Muslims. That's how Muslims see it. So they call them Shiite because they exist as a sect or a section. Now, when you look at the substance that comes out of the body from the bowels, it is also separating itself from a larger body of whatever else is happening in the gut or in the bowels. And it is actually separating itself from the larger body, right? And it is finding a home somewhere else in wherever that stuff goes when you let it loose, okay? I'm trying to be as gentle as I can. I might be some tender ears or squeamish people or whatever. Well, if you're going to go into the sciences, you can't afford to be squeamish. You might end up in the operating room. You cannot afford to be squeamish. So that's why I said this class is not going to be for all of you. But if it's for you, just bear with it, bite down on something, you know, uh, and pay careful attention because where I'm going is not comedy. Where I'm going is the absolute most serious uh, level of investigation that human beings, especially from our situation, that we could ever investigate. This is information that has been hidden from us. It's information that was never intended to reach the eyes and the ears of people like you and me. And we have to continue to give credit where credit is due and thank Allah for Iman Warathuddin Muhammad who introduced a lot of these concepts to us. And most of it, I would say, went way over our heads. And it's because of the conditioning that our people have had since being in this part of the world. We've been conditioned to not respond readily, at least to higher knowledge. That's why many of us, we don't go to college, you know, we don't go to the university. We go maybe grade school, maybe junior high, intermediate school, maybe high school, and we graduate and we find a job. Because many of us, too many of us are not interested in higher learning, especially when it comes to science. So the SCI in the word science is the same as the SH in the English and the Arabic language, meaning to separate. So if you get yourself a good pair of SCISSORS scissors, what are you doing in using them? You're using them to separate pieces of paper or whatever else it is you're cutting into. So again, through metamorphosis in language, the SCI morphed out of the SH sound. So scissor can also be shears. You see how they interchange? The SCI in scissor can be the SH in shears that you use to cut your bushes on your lawn. All right, so that's the primer. Now I'm going to go into the meat. Stand by while I pull up my notes. Pay very, very careful attention tonight because this is a sneak peek into what most of semester number 20 is going to be presenting to you in terms of the level of information. It's not going to be difficult for you to learn if you pay attention because everything, according to science, that you pay attention to expands. So if you really want to get this information, all you have to do is pay attention. Don't worry about understanding everything as you're hearing it or seeing it on the screen. That doesn't happen first. The first thing that happens is that your mind has to develop the habit of paying attention. And paying tuition is not a bad idea either. <laughs> That'll help you to learn this. You say, well, I done spent this money. I better buckle down and see what this man is talking about. So our subject for tonight, dear learners and others, is nature versus nurture, according to the, the fitra. Nature versus nurture, according to the fitra. 
And as I stated in the email, these are going to be our keywords for this evening. They are dielectric inertia plane, Taurus field energies, red shift, blue shift, electromagnetism. And I wanted you to study the letters nun, ta, and also tau, the two T sounds, and ra from your nunetics book. So that's going to be the T sound, pardon me, that's going to be the N sound, the T sound, and the R sound in your nunetics book. And uh, mind you, this is going to be part one. This is too extensive a subject to capture in one sitting. Now you are being introduced to the beginnings of a new found science of personal and social psychology, which I have termed fitrology. Fitrology is simply the study of the fitra. The scientific world has a version of it, which they call patternology. You can look that up in the encyclopedia. Patternology. Now the term fitrology, I believe is a better term in that it is more descriptive of what is taking place, not only in the created matter's form, but even more importantly, in how that created matter functions. The fitra is concerned with both form and function. Let's look at what they say patternology is. They call it the knowledge of patterns. This is their words. These are their words. The journey of becoming is a clear synopsis of the relationship between our behaviors, actions, and our awareness, which is an expression of our consciousness. It illustrates how we each become the product of our behaviors and how our sense of self is constructed around that. The journey of becoming offers us a formula well worth remembering, which is as follows. Our behaviors become traits, our traits become habits, which lay the foundation for our personality. Those habits become patterns, which in turn set the foundation for our character. And it is those patterns <clears throat> let me i'm sorry i lost my place there I'm trying to let somebody in <laughs> give you one moment yes let me recount that our behaviors become traits our traits become habits which lay the foundation for our personality those habits become patterns which in turn set the foundation for our character. It is those patterns that then create the drivers which lead to our nature. Our nature is the point in our life's journey when we have become whatever has most dominated our thinking and in a world, good or bad. So let's recount the steps that they give as the trail towards becoming. This author says that behaviors become traits and that traits become habits which form the foundation of our personalities. He then says that habits become patterns and that patterns set the foundation for our character. Patterns create the drivers which lead to our nature, end quote. So the positioning of these concepts as the author is describing them are responsible for the outcome of what is being called nature. Our nature, human nature. This, however, is not totally correct. A trait is a quote, distinguishing quality or feature. That's a dictionary definition. A trait, I repeat, is a distinguishing, something that sets you apart, 
quality, however, quality or feature. And if you're real swift as a nunetics learner, you will see and hear right away that even the word feature could be possibly related to the word fitra. Mm. If you're really, really swift, you'll hear also the connections between the word fitra and the word future. We'll jump into that a little bit down the road. Just keep in mind that a trait is a distinguishing quality or feature. Qualities grow out of quantities. Life is first quantitative. Life presents itself initially as a quantity. That's why every time a baby is born, what's the first thing that they do? They measure the child. How much does the child weigh? How tall, how long is the child's body? They make sure that all of the measurements pertaining to the quantities are in place. Are there two eyes in the head? That kind of thing. <laughs> are there five fingers on each hand and five toes on each foot? They're measuring quantities they're not asking oh you know what the child's iq is the child just got here it's not dealing with quality yet it's not dealing with information input yet it's dealing with the quantity those physical literal measurements those things that can be measured this is very important for the establishment of this new psychology that i'm telling you about tonight that many of you are going to be participating in and become the champions of because America and the world need to this fitra based in numetics psychology. So life is first quantitative or measurable prior to becoming qualitative, meaning immeasurable. Qualities cannot be measured. How do you measure goodness? How do you measure being merciful? Do you have mercy on someone and say, well, that, that's enough. <laughs> time up, time up. I don't have any more time to be, you know, to be merciful. <laughs> I'll go back to being cruel. So that's not mercy. So we have to begin to pay real attention to what's being said to us in this world, especially through the academics and the so-called the sciences. Life is first measurable in terms of quantity. You're born poor, you're born with no money, you're born, I'm about to say no money in your pockets, you're born with no pockets. If you had money, you wouldn't know where to stash it. <laughs> you're born bare and naked and alone, except for mama there and the doctors possibly to rescue you. So you're in need of things, measurable things. So they put you in a swaddling cloth, that's measurable. Mama sticks her breast in your mouth, that's a measurable uh, uh, apparatus, if you will, for feeding the baby, either bottle or the mother's nipple. So all of these things come in measurements is the point. Even the mother comes in a measurable form the very fact that we call her mom, or in Arabic, we would say um or ummi, my mother. The very fact that she has those double M's in her title represents an idea related to measurements. Now, you might say, well, instructor, I thought you said that M means water. And yeah, show me a body of water that can't be measured. I'll wait. <laughs> I don't care if it's the Atlantic Ocean. They pretty much know how much water is in that circumference or in that lake or in that pool or in whatever measure of water and water in your sink. It has a particular measurement because water is always seeking a level or leveling off. And therefore, it has to have a contour. It has to have a container. So every word that you can think of that has an M in it, especially at the front of it, is also going to be dealing with measurements. Take the word mountain. It's measurable. 
you just give me, just, just make up an M word, write it down on your page and give it to me later. I'm going to show you, if you can't already see it, that it's related to a particular measurement, minuscule, maximum. All of these things have to do with measurements, sizes, quantities of things, not qualities necessarily, quantities of things. Let's continue. So life begins with genetic awareness called intelligence. And I've told you over and over again that the word intelligence means internal telling coming from the gents or the genes, intelligence, internal communication that is coming from the genes. It's not coming from what your mother put in there, or what your daddy put in there, or your uncle Joe or whoever, his traits. No, it's not beginning with traits. It's beginning with an internal sense that is able to communicate straight from the genes, straight from the DNA. Now that intelligence becomes immeasurable once it establishes its relationship with cosmic awareness, AKA, cosmic intelligence. So there are two levels of intelligence being discussed right now. There is genetic intelligence that is part and parcel of your DNA, RNA makeup created for you by Allah. No one else could create it. No one else could bestow that upon you, your genes. And there are rings and rings of information that Allah has deposited within the core of your genes. And that's how the baby knows where to go for milk. No one has to teach it. All you have to do is place it in proximity to the mother's breast. And the baby can even sniff her way up to the breast if it's not on the breast. It's, it's genetic intelligence that is giving them those marching orders. You don't have to teach the baby how to poop, how to pee. How or if something's put up to the baby's lips, the baby will automatically begin trying to taste it. It's not going to bring it up to its eye as though the eye is the tongue. It's not going to do that because the genetic intelligence is teaching the child where the food is supposed to go. Your mother doesn't have to teach you as an infant how to grow your hair, how to grow your teeth, how to grow your bones. All of that information has been meticulously clocked into the infant's DNA, RNA structure as intelligence. So life begins with genetic intelligence, but life can grow or what we call evolve under the Rab principle. Rab is a title for Allah which means the one who not only creates, but the one who puts that creation now through an evolutionary um, movement, if you will, from unrefined to extremely refined, from uncivilized, baby throwing food everywhere, laughing, got food all over his face, sitting in the baby chair in the high chair, will poke you in the eye if you give it a chance. That's uncivilized. But the training that that infant is able to get will eventually civilize that infant's behavior so that they can then be presentable in company, sitting at the table like everyone else, enjoying a nice meal at five years old, seven years old, hopefully 12, I hope by 12 years old. We're able to be civilized enough to sit around the table without uh, doing like those other guys did in the movie uh, when they started doing the food fight scene, you know, <laughs> grownups throwing food around. That's, a, that's pathetic. All right. But we grow out of that right around the age of one and a half, two years old, as the Quran says, your weaning is as to years old or is at two years old Allah says and Allah knows us best because he created us so that genetic awareness that genetic intelligence that we just described that has been clocked into your very DNA it evolves under the Rabb principle that Allah has established to eventually, and I would even say hopefully, grow to become cosmic 
or connected to cosmic intelligence. We think about a human life and we think about the DNA within our genes and how that uh, functions and what else is operating inside the human being, not realizing sometimes that if no human beings were on the earth, as was once suspected, that we weren't here until Allah created human life. There was the plant life, there was the other animals that existed, aquatic life began to appear and come out of the water onto the shore and other kinds of creatures began to develop. But then Allah saw fit to develop what we now call human life. That's a wonderful phenomenon. But before this human life was here and before any other life form that expresses genetic intelligence through DNA composition, before, when this was just a cosmic rock floating around in space is what I'm saying. The universe still possessed cosmic intelligence. They call it cosmic DNA, look it up. I only want tonight's class to be for those people who are willing to do the work and the homework. Look up the term cosmic DNA and you'll be surprised at what you don't know, and <laughs> not to mention what they didn't want you to know. So through this evolution brought about by our Rabb of El Alamin, the Rabb of all these systems of knowledge, Allah is able to connect the knowledge that he power packed into your genetic code He's able to grow you stage by stage by stage until you can make another connection. That latter connection is with cosmic DNA or cosmic intelligence. So you go from genetic intelligence in the physical DNA deposited into you by Allah. And that evolutionary life is able to grow to recognize that there's a higher form of frequency operating in the universe and it's called the cosmic stuff, cosmic substance. Imam Muhammad spoke of it as the creation of the cosmic man in you and me, cosmic man. He said, it's when the concerns of the human being cease to be local, cease to be racial, cease to be linguistic, separated by languages, separated by cultures and fashion and all of these things and what kind of food you like. It's when the life becomes elevated or evolved to the point where it begins to yearn for something much more substantial and much more, um, let's call it quality, <laughs> much more quality than all of the quantities it has been chasing for all of these years. My race, how many black people there are on earth? Well, you know, there's so many billions of us now and, you know, in America and how many billions of people are in America and how many, uh, pe you know, all of that is, uh, all of that is quantitative, is dealing with quantities of things, how much money I have in the bank. That's a quantity. That's just the, the lower tier or the lower level of your human existence. And we're walking around here thinking that that's the ultimate achievement and it's not. That achievement will not get you into Jannah. Hello. It's time to wake up. Quantitative, quantitative achievements will not get you into paradise. Quantitative achievements on this earth for human beings doesn't even elevate you above what many animals and insects can do. They have quantities of things. Insects like the ants can build air conditioned homes. Look at how meticulous the bees are in designing their home setting. Oxagonal, completely air conditioned. We're still around here with these pyramid structures on the front of our homes because we're so stuck on ancient Egypt. <laughs> the front of our homes look like pyramids. All of them, just walk down the block. All you see are these pyramid, pyramid, pyramids in the front of your house. And they're still building them four square. And that's not the best design for construction. 
So I want you to truly understand what it is I'm saying when I tell you that we have now entered into a new epoch. We've entered into a new uh, transition of sorts that has taken us out of one particular cosmic age into a succeeding cosmic age. And if you don't know or refuse to want to know anything about these cosmic positionings, planetary positionings, and how that actually affects you and your life going into the unforeseeable future. If you don't want to know anything about it, again, this is not the class for you. Sign off and go watch some cartoons or some superhero movies or something because this is not going to satisfy your appetite. If that appetite is simply for the material world and what that world has to offer you, you have to want that but you have to want to build upon that in a way which will earn you the latter part of the life, which is qualitative. Allah says, <laughs> To seek with all that Allah has made available to you, your home in al-akhira, the latter expression of life the qualitative expression of life. Well, tansa, but do not neglect and do not forget nasibaka, your personal share, min ed dunya, from the material world, the quantitative world, because you need a measurement of quantity in order to even think about having some success in the quality life. Can you live a quality life right now? If you marry a woman, you or a woman marries a man and they begin to have children, can you live a quality life and you have no material substance? No, you're just not supposed to become absorbed, overly attentive to the material life as though the material life is your paradise. That's all Allah is asking you. Allah says in the Quran, who told you that the good things of this dunya were not for you. Allah said they are for you in this life and they will be exclusively for, oh, I love that ayah. <laughs> they will be exclusively for you in the, dunya, in, in the hereafter, pardon me, in al akhirah So Allah says that the good things of this life are for you here and there. But Allah warns us against becoming absorbed by what he calls a hayyatu dunya. Hayya, the life of the dunya. Beautiful when you understand it. Let's continue. So two types of intelligences. The first one, genetic. The secondary one, cosmic. And we're trying to reach the cosmic. That's what instructor in Bilal, instructor in Bilal, Benjamin Bilal has been assigned to do to the best of his ability. I pray that I'm successful, but that's what I believe I'm designed to do. I'm designated by Allah, not by people. I'm designated by Allah to discover the proper, the appropriate, the significant language, words, letters, frequencies that will help you develop internally, inside so that you'll be able to make that graduation, not physically necessarily, you might lose a limb, you might lose an eye physically, but it does not preclude you from making that graduation on the inside, what is called the nefs and the graduation of the nefs, which they translate as soul. The soul has to graduate. It has to spiral upwards like your DNA. According to this particular article, cosmic DNA is a term used by potentialism theory. That's a theory. Study that. Look it up. That term cosmic DNA that I just introduced to you is a term that's used by people who purport the potentialism theory in science to express the very inherent nature of potential itself. 
Nothing in the universe exists outside of its influence. It is like a cosmic genome that tells everything in the universe its purpose. Oh, boy, oh, boy, this is beautiful. This is tasty. <laughs> He says, it's like, I'm, I'm supposing it's a he, it could be a she writing this. They're saying that the inherent nature of potential in the universe is like a cosmic genome, a sequencing, a, a, a sequencing of coded information that tells every, not some things, everything in the universe. Are you in the universe? talking to the knucklehead now. Are you also in the you? Well, it's talking to you too. It's knocking on your door, just like I knocked on the head of this microphone. And it tells everything in the universe its purpose and how it should broadly behave and strive. So the inclination and the inspiration to move forward and evolve cosmically, genetically, Ooh, it is clocked into your fitra, partner. We have another article here. I believe this one was written by Deepak Chopra, which many of you know or have heard of. This woman here who is speaking on his site, her name is Sylvia Clare, and she's a mindfulness teacher. I'm not sure what that is, but that's her title. She says, quote, intuition is the highest form of intelligence, transcending all individual abilities and skills. Then Deepak goes on to say, trusting your gut, listening to your vibes, tapping into the higher self, tuning into your sixth sense, plugging into cosmic intelligence. These all describe the same experience, accessing your intuition. And as all of you know, I call it supra intuition at this level. Intuition is the ability to acquire knowledge immediately without conscious rational thought. So intuition on this level, again, I call it supra intuition. On this level, Intuition is actually steps above the intellect. Now, remember our meaning for the word intellect. We gave you the meaning for intelligence. Now we're going to give it to you for the word intellect. It simply means internal election. The electing, the choosing, the choice making that you're doing inside your head and inside your heart. When you say, yeah, I'm comfortable with that. Let me bring that in. Or when you say that seems to be a threat to my existence or a threat to my family's situation, I'm not going to allow that guy to come into my house anymore. Not after the way he acted up, came drunk to the house and started looking at my daughter's kind of funny. I'm not going to let that happen again. I might have to kill a man. See, those are internal choices that the mind and the heart are making in cooperation with each other. But what this is saying is that this level of intuition actually supersedes even the ability to reason. So many are thinking that the rational mind is the highest level of human endeavor, internal endeavor, and it's not. The rational mind is the reason why the world is as messed up as it is. You don't believe it? Go to those people who haven't had all of these years <laughs> of being in charge of the world. <laughs> and see if the Amazon people, see if their world is as messed up as our modern Western world. And you're going to find that it is reams away from being as messed up. And in fact, if you find measures of mess up in their world, it's because the Western world has been there <laughs> and helped to corrupt and pollute their world. They're not anything that they've done on their own as they were submitting to what they felt was the best lifestyle for so-called primitive people to live out. They knew how to raise their children and get married. They knew how to hunt and they knew how to share their goods with other people. And they knew how to help the weaker ones in the tribe. And they knew how to acclimate themselves to new tribes that were measurements away from them. They knew all of these ways of getting along. 
and they didn't have any real need to develop a rational program to do such. Most of them were situated upon instinctive motivations, the need for food, the need for water, the need for uh, comfort and peace and security. All of those are clocked into your instincts by Allah. And every creature, even the non-human creature, uh, creatures, that's what they crave. That level of instinctive security, the survival instinct and in how to handle what to do in order to stay here another day. <laughs> that's called survival. That's not living, that's survival. So the so-called primitive people, we call them primal societies. That's what they were into without the need. In fact, you see pictures of so-called cavemen and all of that, and you see how flat their heads and their foreheads are. It's because a measurement, if you will, of cranium had not yet developed or been evolved for them by Allah. We call it the neocortex brain, the largest brain now amongst the triune brain. Hmm? It wasn't there. So all they had to go on were their instincts and their emotions, no reasoning. And they did quite well, but not having the rational faculty or the ability to reason things through and choose the better over the worse, also had a downfall. And the downfall was that they could not advance their world beyond where they were, just like animals cannot advance their world. The whales, the giraffe, the, all of these other creatures, they cannot advance their world. They don't live in condominiums because they don't have the rational ability to decide that a condo might feel better than a hut. See? So because they don't have that decision-making capacity, their world stays stagnant. It's what Imam Muhammad called dust. Dust, meaning unrelated materials. They don't want to know what the other side of the world looks like. They're not interested. They're only interested in what they can you know, coagulate and bring together that will help them survive. And they're really not interested in how the rest of the world fares. Some of them don't even know that there is a rest of the world until the Western man stepped on their shores. Where'd you come from? See? So Imam Muhammad called that the dust stage of human evolution, dust. And he said that the human being was designed by Allah to grow or evolve from dust to industry, industry. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. The challenge for human life is to be able to grow from that substance that is not prone to uh, wanting to be together like clay. See, Allah says he created us men thing from clay. Clay likes to stick together. But in the developmental history of humans on this earth, it was a, a, a rough, rough ride trying to get human beings to know each other better to cooperate with each other. Allah even had to put it in the Quran that he did not create tribes and nations or nations and tribes that they may be disdainful towards each other, but that they should acknowledge each other, that they should cooperate with each other, get to know each other. That's a challenge within the human nature to expand the breast. <laughs> and begin to accept people and their concerns and their problems and their inventions and their wisdom. See, we accept the good and the bad. And both of those things operating within the human soul allow the human being's soul to expand. Now we're in the work over here. Yeah, this is wonderful. Alhamdulillah for everyone who has joined us tonight, who has taken the time out of their busy schedules to be with us. Please do your best to keep your computers and your phones silenced. Keep them on mute, please. I right, thank you. So he calls it trusting your gut or listening to your vibes, tapping into your higher self, tuning into that sixth sense, plugging into cosmic intelligence. These all describe the same experience 
which is accessing your intuition. Intuition is the ability to acquire knowledge immediately, just like that, without conscious, rational thought. How long has Instructor Bilal been telling you that this is a potentiality in the human nature? Well, how did I come across that understanding? Because Allah tells you that in the Quran. He says, when my servants, quote unquote, ask you about me, I am near. He didn't say I'm all the way out there in the galaxy on the seventh heaven sitting on a throne. He didn't say all of that. He said, I am near. Right after that, he says, that I respond to the petition of every petitioner when he petitions, when she petitions, when they petitions. It could be an eight-year-old child. Allah says that he, he, he responds. The word is ujibu. Ujibu. Ujibu doesn't just mean that Allah responds. Allah, and he's speaking in the first person, which is important to understand. This is Allah speaking directly to you. He says, I respond to the da'wah, to the, 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 the da'wa, the da of every da'i, of every caller. I respond when, when that person calls on me. Ujibu means that I, I drop what I'm doing as Rabbil Alameen, so to speak, and I respond directly to that person when he calls. And then Allah asks the question, who will respond to my call? <laughs> ah, see, this is reciprocal. And when he asks us who will respond to his call, he doesn't use the word ujibu. He uses another version of that root letter formation. That means who will attempt <laughs> to respond. <laughs> so look at what Allah is saying. He's saying, I respond to them immediately. And I'll be satisfied if they just attempt to respond to my call even if they don't make it all the way, if, if they forget along the road where they were going when they were trying to get to what I asked them to do, Allah still says that I respond to their call immediately. So that's what this is saying. But you have to have a certain level of human development in order for this to be effectuated is the point. You can't just be knucklehead Joe and knucklehead Jim somewhere in a gym exercising and say, oh, I want to talk to Allah today as soon as I finish this, this reefer. Stick. Allah knows my weaknesses. And as, you know, as soon as I get me a bottle of Hennessy, I'll be in the right frame of mind then Ak, to talk, you know, to really talk with Allah. No, that ain't going to happen, partner, because you're dialing the wrong number. You want to talk to me? You can't be calling everybody else's number. You want to talk to Hennessy? Go, go to Mr. Hennessy's house. You want to smoke the reefer? Go to the drug dealer's house. You'll call him on the phone. Don't be calling his house looking for me. Allah speaking. No, you got to dial the number that Allah gave you. It's a cosmic number. But it works every time. Trust me, I'm one who knows from experience that as soon as you call on Allah for your needs of in conversation or because there's something internal that needs to be addressed that no other human can help you with, Allah responds just like that. And the other reason why many of us don't know that is because we're not even present when he makes the call back to us. We're so busy thinking about the landlord or so busy thinking about Jesus, the Lord, or so busy, you know, we're thinking about all of these other concerns that are really artificial concerns that we missed the call. Allah's calling all of the time. You might have put that petition out in a dua. And as soon as you finished, you look out your window as I do most of the time, and there might have been a homeless person passing by your house and you didn't go respond to the homeless. And you had plenty of food in your cupboard. This is how Allah puts in his calls to you. 
when he says, have they responded to my call? How many of them will at least make an attempt? Say in your heart, oh man, it's too late for me to run down there and get that man a loaf of bread. But I wanted to. See, that's just, see, estegibu is the word. Just, just have the inclination. Just, just try, seek, at least put it in your heart to want to do it. Estegibu. Even if you don't complete the task. That's all Allah asks us to do. But for him, ujibu, spot on, right on. What is it you want? Boom, it's there. But you have to be swift enough to know where to look for Allah's gifts and blessings and answers. So that intuition, according to Deepak Chopra, is the ability to acquire knowledge immediately without conscious rational thought. It is bypassing the linear thought and inference process of the mind to directly perceive or cognize a truth or insight. So in other words, you can receive insight from on high without depending on any linear rational reasoning process in the aql, in the human intellect. You don't need that for what we're talking about. This is a downloading or a processing that Allah can deliver straight to you. He can clock it into your DNA if he wanted to so that it's your permanent possession. Again, I'm a witness. Rather than cobbling together different thoughts, ideas, and perceptions to reach a conclusion, intuition is a direct download of the final answer minus all the mental busy work. It's a download. Do you know there's a word in the Quran for this kind of mental and spiritual download? It's called a dhikr. Dhikr. A dhikr. You know when you do dhikr? You think it's just counting on your phalanges? You know, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. Sub oh, what a waste of time that is. How can you say that's a waste of time? That's a part of our deen, brother. You can't be just maligning the deen, brother. They have part of what deen? We all tell you to do that in the Quran. And those of you who do it and have done it for years as I have done it, you tell me what the noticeable difference is after you finish the dickering a hundred times, you know, 99 times, and then Allah, la, 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 la. Tell me what the noticeable difference is. Is there a measurable increase in anything that you've gotten after doing all of this ritualistic stuff that they have uh, very cleverly seduced most of the Muslim world into performing with no tangible results, including your ritual salat, no tangible results. They have duped the majority of the Muslim world into believing that Allah is calling mostly for rituals and worship of him and venerating of a human being that they introduced to us as Prophet Muhammad, venerating him. Every time his name is mentioned, we, we, we practically make sajda in our minds. It got so extended in history after the Quran had been completed, collated, and delivered into the world, it got so crazy for Muslims trying to prove their Muslim worth to Christians and Jews that Muslims among a particular empire called the Umayyad Empire, they invented what's called Shahadatain, two testimonies where Allah only left you with one in the Quran, la ilaha illallah, zip the lip after that there's nothing that is to be associated with allah in the same breath as allah in terms of testifying to his oneness testifying to his might his power his wisdom all of that when you read about those words in the quran they are singular and uniquely attributed to allah with no co-partner along with him so there's no as shadowing la ilaha illallah 
Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Now I know what you've been told. I know what you've been taught that that is intended to create a separation in the human psyche between Allah and humans. And I say that that's mistaken in logic. That's mistaken logic. If that were necessary, then Allah would have put it in the Quran. He would have put them together in the Quran if that was necessary to make man say, there's Allah in, hmm. <sighs> Should I worship a human? No, no, Muhammad is just a man like you. No, that's a, those are separate statements in the Quran. Say, I am a mortal just like you. That's separate. See, Allah could have said, La ilaha illallah. Right behind it. That there's nothing worthy of your devotional attention except Allah. And I am, Muhammad speaking, just a mortal like the rest of you. Allah could have put those together in the Quran, but he didn't. Because it wasn't necessary. Once you understand what Allah is, along with who Allah is, your human brain can never make that mistake. As soon as you hear that he is not like any of his creation, he does not eat, he does not sleep, he does not slumber, he's always working, he's always in the process of creating new things. Ain't no human being you know like that. And if you do know humans who are always creating, ask them where they got the stuff that they're using to create. Allah didn't go nowhere to go what, get what he needs to create. Allah says, fayakun. Allah says, uh, you know, just uh, Allah just brings it into existence from nothing. He's al-bari. He creates from no thing, from nothing. Humans can't do that. So after all of that divine logic being placed in the Quran, what's the need in saying that Muhammad? And why wouldn't it say, la ilaha illallah? And then include all of the messengers and say, they're just, you know, they're all messengers of Allah. Why single out Muhammad when Allah says in the Quran that you're to make no distinctions between any of his messengers? Explain that one to me. You know who I'm talking to. I'm talking past this audience now. Way past it. You know who I'm talking to. And sometimes I got to talk to people rough because of the times that we're living in, the seriousness of the times that we're living in. We're sitting around here looking at our TikTok thinking that we have all the time in the world and you don't understand what's right around the corner. And if you are not physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually prepared, you ain't going to make it. You're going to be a part of what Imam Muhammad said was coming called the great elimination of the human soul. Boy, I'd hate to be on the other end of that. I'd hate to be on the other side of that fence looking, trying to look through a little peak hole, see how all of the, of the good people are faring who still have souls. This is a very serious day in time. Let's continue. Hmm. Intuition is your birthright. It is part of being human an inherent guidance system that can keep you safe from harm, directed you to the truth in any situation, lead you to your highest good and move you toward the evolution of your consciousness. But how does it work? How could I, a tiny separate individual in an infinitely vast universe, have direct access to cosmic intelligence? How are you to make sense of an invisible, non-tangible, perceptible mechanism that lies outside of the realm of your five senses? The answer can be found in a philosophical model of reality called the holographic universe. So that's another topic that you're to look up as a homework assignment. The holographic universe. Getting back to my words, <clears throat> human growth does not begin with behavior and then become traits. As the author of the article before this one states, 
human growth beginning with behavior is a behaviorist hypothesis introduced by B.F. Skinner. So put him on your list. Find out who he is. Find out when he appeared on the scene. Find out who came before him and what they established as psychology. This is how you have to learn to study. So behaviorism was introduced by B.F. Skinner, and it became the leading psychology model for the Western world, replacing Sigmund Freud's many hypothes uh, hypotheses relative to how the conscious mind operates. This is what Sigmund Freud's theory was all about, how human consciousness works. In fact, he coined the word conscience and conscious. You see the word science right there in the word conscience, conning the science. That's what he was about. <laughs> man, oh man. True human growth. And I take you back to what Imam Muhammad established as the meaning for Muslim in the Quran. He said, whenever you read the term Muslim in the Quran, he said, translate it as true human. There ain't nothing ethnic about a Muslim. There ain't nothing geographical about a Muslim. Muslim means one who has accepted to be at peace with his or her own true self, true motivations and has entered into an agreement to live with other people who accept that same philosophy. I'm not everything you are, but I, I, none of what I am needs to be in contention with you to the point where I disturb your peace. If I'm living with the Hindus, let the Hindus do what Hindus do. I'm still living as a true Muslim, a true human, a man at peace. Don't come to me with any game. That's all we ask. Don't come with any game. We are Muslims, as the Quran expresses. So that true human growth begins as genetic awareness that develops into consciousness. You don't begin this life with consciousness, not if conscious means with choice. What infant comes here choosing? intellectually dis uh, making decisions or even emotionally making decisions. The baby doesn't even choose its mother's breast based on some emotional decision. It chooses its mother's breast based on its genetic proclivity. Its genes are dictating the instincts in the baby's flesh are dictating where to go for the milk. And the baby's genetic body is processing the milk. The baby's not saying go into the past the lips, down past the tongue, into the throat, into the interior and the gutter, the gullet or whatever, they got, and then send that nutrition out into the arteries. Hey, no baby, no, no human doing that. It's a quiet process. You don't get any more peaceful than what is happening in the body to keep the body here. You drink water, you don't know where that water's going. All you know is it comes out at some point when you got to go to the bathroom. That's all you know. Same thing with the food. You don't know all of the many different places. It's a quiet process. Wonderful science. We're walking you into if you have the patience. So it begins with the genetic awareness. It means your mind your conscious decision-making has nothing to do with anything as soon as you're born. It doesn't have anything to do with anything while you're gestating in your mother's womb. You don't know nada except for the information that Allah clocked into your genetics that teaches your body, your bones, your blood, how to grow, where to go, how to come out. Now, once you're out into the world, that's when your five basic senses become activated. That baby opens her little eyes like we saw our beautiful granddaughter do last week and begins that little beady eye just peeking or like, what in the world <laughs> is the world? What? This is not what I'm used to. Allah gave the baby eyes that could open while the baby was in the womb, but there was nothing to see. 
You see how Allah was preparing that infant for this new life in existence? Allah gave the infant in gestation within its mother's womb a bunch of stuff. Five fingers, five toes, but it couldn't use it in the womb. Taste buds, but it wasn't tasting varieties of things in the womb. It was being fed through its mother's umbilical cord, fluids. Gave it ears, and the only thing it could hear is being in that close proximity to its mother's heart. But all of the rest of that, those tools that Allah endowed that growing embryo feed us with, it couldn't use it in the womb. Now I want you to transfer that logic. This is what I mean by divine logic. I want you to transfer that logic to you and me in this life. Don't you know that there are many tools that Allah is giving us, has given us in this life that are not for this life, they're for the next life. I want you to think about that. There is development in you that is more for when you leave this physical life and hopefully enter into the paradise that Allah speaks about in the Quran where the fullest expression of those tools and their usage will come into uh, fruition. So some people say, I, I hate being so good. The world, this world doesn't reward good. So I'm going to be a little bit bad so I can get some of the reward of this dunya. Allah did say get some of the dunya. No, Allah said don't get any of the hayat of dunya, <laughs> the, the life, the thing that keeps this world's heart beating. Don't get any of that. Just get what you need in order to establish the necessary components for graduating into the next life and then build up your arsenal of behaviors, of attitudes, of intelligence, et cetera. That's going to be the step ladder that will take you higher and higher up the evolutionary scale of your soul's development so that that soul can then be delivered into Jannah amongst Allah's ibad his workers, not his slaves, his workers. There was a time when work used to make a human being feel good and not doing anything, just sitting around the house with no job made a human being feel bad. So when Allah says among his workers, he's saying a great thing for human life. <laughs> So it begins as genetic awareness and then develops into consciousness where the intellect is becoming awakened and is now able to make choices. The more that the awareness, awareness is just a sense of things that are happening. It can't make any kind of rational deduction of anything though. It doesn't even know that that's mommy when it first meets its mother. It doesn't know it was just inside of her body. These are rational things that we learn in time. But the baby doesn't know that. The baby just is aware that it's not the same environment. And I, maybe I need to pay a little bit more attention to what's going on here. I'm not surrounded by fluid anymore. I'm surrounded by cotton. <laughs> you know, I mean, they don't reason like that, but you get the point. Hmm? Awareness recognizes differences. And everybody begins with awareness. Now I'm giving you the proper step-by-step -step psychological tools for reversing the levels of psychological damage that human beings have been suffering from, especially the so-called African-American population. Boy, do we need this psychology. Like we don't need anything else. We talking about black consciousness. No, what you need is human awareness first. <laughs> you need to be aware of your human content, that there are human needs. And the first need is recognized by the infant as the need for information. I was satiated hours ago. I'm hungry. Now I'm thirsty. 
what yeah, what happened? How did I become fed? I don't know. I can't know that rationally. And all I know to do is just express myself. And the only thing that I can do right now is cry out until somebody comes to my rescue. So the baby cries until mama comes and satisfies that infant. That's awareness. That's not consciousness. After the child becomes months old, six months, you know, seven, eight months, a year old, especially, then the baby has moved from mere awareness of things. It's not just aware that that's mama. It knows its mother's name. It knows its own name when mama calls it, even though it can't talk back necessarily. Huh? It knows the faces of its siblings and its daddy and all of that. So it's growing from mere awareness into consciousness, observing things around it and making choices as to what it wants to be next to, who it wants to be in proximity to, and who seems to represent a threat. And therefore, I'm going to act up and act out until that person gets away from me. That's called intuition also, but it's on the sub level of intuition. It's not a trusted intuition as Imam Muhammad stated. It's a hit and miss intuition, but it serves as the basement level of intuition until we can grow up and grow out, climb that ladder of evolution and reconnect with that intuition. But by that time, we're reconnecting with a supra level of intuition that the universe <laughs> is responsible for spreading far and wide. Huh? And we tap into that. And that is much more dependable than that infantile intuition. Musa in the Quran, he met the frequencies related to that supra intuitive power. When he left his family after perceiving a fire, and Nastunar, I perceive a fire. Where was he perceiving this fire? Right here. Right here. But not even as intellect. He was perceiving it as intuition. That same base level, infantile, not all of the way to be trusted level of intuition that all of us begin as. But he trusted it enough to go investigate. See, that's what your intuition has you do. It's part and parcel of your curiosities. I'm going to prove that to you. It is part and parcel of your curiosities, your intuition, that base level intuition. When the baby intuits that you're going to be a fun person to be around because it sees you goo goo ga ga and it starts laughing at you, then the baby wants to be around you. The baby might reach out and touch your finger or something, or touch your hand, or, or even reach up and say, pick me up, right? That's the baby's, the baby doesn't know anything about you. You can be uncle, whoever, doesn't matter, auntie, you know, you can be the witch of the week and be the aunt of that infant. And that infant don't know that you into black magic and, you know, all soothsaying and all they, that baby don't know that it just, it perceives intuitively that you're a nice person. See, that's what we mean by that baby level of intuition, that childish level of intuition is not sustainable. You can't build your life on it is what we're saying. So Musa left his family and he went toward the fire. After expressing the words, and nas to nar, and nas means he was perceiving. So you could perceive something in your mind that's not there in reality. Hmm? So, and nas to nar, but it's the same phrase when Allah talks about the human, and nas. <laughs> so what does that tell you as far as Quranic logic goes? That human perception is the overriding frequency related to the group of people that Allah calls an nas. 
that a nas, on the most part, are regulated by intuitive urges, not by the intellect per se. Intuitive urges. Further proof, instructed Bilal. Okay, let's do some consonantal connections here. The word nas with its ns sounds or consonants is related to the English term nose with its ns consonantal connections. Nas nose. And what is the nose a symbol of in psychology? Intuition. The people in history who called themselves Gnostics, they were people who believed very heavily in the power of their own ability to intuit information from God. And therefore we don't need popes and bishops and all of those people. We don't need them reading our scripture to us. We can read the scripture and then we can go out and make a, a dua or something, you know, sit on a rock or sit in a cave and God will send us the message intuitively. We don't need them anymore. And that's what caused the most friction between the Catholic church and the Gnostic order. And the Gnostics were not just Christians. They were also Jews. The Gnostics were not just Christians. They were also ancient Persians that ended up uh, arresting true Al-Islam from the overzealous Arabs that brought it into Persia at the point of a sword, by the way, and forced the ancient Zoroastrians, the Persians, the Gnostic Persians, to convert to what they were calling Islam, but at the point of a sword. And those, those Persians, to this day, they haven't forgiven those Muslims. They vowed that they would one day come back and get their stuff back. And they did it through the manipulation of language. Now, that's a whole nother subject that I'm not going to get into right now. But they did it not by uh, writing a new text and causing it to replace the Quran. They simply went to the Quran itself and they started making notes of all of the important Quranic terms that were given in Arabic. And because the Persians had a language, which although was not of the same family group as Arabic, Arabic is from the Afro-Asiatic family of Semitic languages, whereas Persian, Urdu, Farsi, those languages are from the Indo-European branch of families, Indo-European, out of India, out of Europe and those places but they sounded so much alike. And the ancient Persian scholars started mixing and matching and replacing meanings for sound alike words. This word, uh, Iman, we have a word that's also sounding like Iman. So we're gonna take their Iman and erase the meaning, the fitra based meaning that the prophet established, their prophet. And we're going to replace it with what our word iman means simply believe, <laughs> believer. <laughs> you believe in Santa Claus. Well, well, that, how is that a strong word? Enough for Allah to reveal it in a scripture. Those who believe and do good. Oh, yeah, that's wisdom from on high. All right. No. That's not what the Quran is. You're missing, boy. 98% of the Quran hasn't even been taught and understood yet. Hmm. Absolutely amazing. So they took words such as salat. There was no word salat in the Quran. There was salat but they took their closely related word salat and replaced the word salat with salat. And for them, salat was a daily ritual that was done at five different positionings of the sun because it was related to the ancient Zoroastrians practice of sun worship. That's what they used to do. They worshiped the sun god called Ahura Mazda. Zoroastrianism, 
Look these things up for yourself. Do not trust a word that I'm telling you. Do your own investigation, your own homework. Ahura Mazda, A-H-U-R-A, second word, M-A-Z-D-A, like the car, Ahura Mazda. See the Ahura or Ahuru, you'll come across it if you type it into your computer. The sun god. So they were worshiping the sun five times a day. And the Persian leaders masquerading as Muslim leaders now in order to keep the beef off because the Muslims had beat them in warfare. They said, we give in, but let us remain the mullahs for our people. They're used to us as leaders. And those people went into the back room and they devised a scheme for taking back their stuff. And many of us knuckleheaded Muslims to this day, because we don't read history, we only read hadiths. We don't know what scam actually took place about 1200 or so years ago in Persia, now called Iran. Not the Iranians' fault, not the, we're not blaming blanketly the Persian people or anything like that. We're blaming those who developed that scheme, but the Muslims shouldn't have been there in the first place because Allah teaches against developments of dynasties and empires. We're not supposed to be empire builders. Where do you find that in the teachings of Muhammad the prophet to go gangs people for their stuff and put your Islam stamp on it and say, now you're gonna be our slaves and our servants. Where do you find that in the history of our prophets, true teachings, which is the Quran to begin with? It's not in there. Allah says that he is not on the side of those who gank people for their stuff in order to develop empires. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it's in there. He does not favor those people. Even if you're gaining wealth and status, don't mis let that a mistake. Don't, let the, don't, don't be mistaken because that's happening that Allah is favoring you. Because something is happening to you inside that you're going to pass down for generations, generations of devastation. That's what happened to Muslims because they allowed their nafs to be influenced and swayed away from fitra-based concepts that kept them in connection with natural life. They wanted the kingly life, the kingly existence. Didn't even want to bring women along with them. They just wanted the men to frolic <laughs> and throw the gold coins in the air and, uh, you know, do the dance and all. Yeah, yeah. Like many people in this world. Let's continue. So we're talking about true human growth that begins as genetic awareness in the DNA and then subsequently develops into the ability to choose consciously based on an activated intellect. And that is what eventually segues into various behaviors. It doesn't begin with behavior. It segues into behaviors after the consciousness has been activated. And then those behaviors are what become embedded within the subconscious portion of the mind. Remember, there's the conscious mind, neocortex. There's what's happening in the subconscious, the mid region of the brain. Hmm? That's the emotional brain and the memory brain. And then the primary brain, the primal brain is that reptilian brain. The reptilian brain that controls the instincts. So you got the top brain controlling your rational thinking, moral and rational thinking. Then you have the brain right beneath that that's controlling your emotions and your memory. Then you have the brain, uh, the most primitive brain called the reptilian brain or the R complex brain, which controls basically your fight or flight instincts, among other instincts, survival instincts. So people who know the psychology of human nature, they know how to manipulate you to no end. And they embedded the behavior part of the human existence into the subconscious into the subconscious. 
it is the repetition of these behaviors which eventually form habits. Habits are not in the beginning of anything. Habits are the end result of all of these other things I just mentioned. And nothing is a habit until you repeat it. <clears throat> nothing, I repeat, is a habit until you continuously repeat it. Even if you did it once, twice, three times a lady, that lady ain't really on your mind that much after that. But if you keep going to see that lady, four, five, six, seven, you know, <laughs> that's another story. That lady's become a habit. So it's the repetition of those behaviors that form habits. Habits are merely the mimetic expression of genetic awareness. I know most of you don't know what the mimetic means. It's from the smaller word meme, M-E-M-E. -M -E. Look it up. They refer to memes as social genes. In other words, what your G-E-N-E-S does, what your genes do, I should say, on the genetic level of expression, your memes do exactly the same thing. They replicate in exactly the same way. They replicate your behaviors, your social inclinations, but it does it on the social level, not on the genetic level, but it does exactly the same thing. One is operating on the level of your biology, genes. The other one is operating on the level of your psychology and your sociology, that's the memes. So that's what habits are. They are mimetic expression, not a genetic expression. There's nothing in your genes that cause habits. But my father, you know, he was a heavy smoker. So, I mean, that's really the reason why I smoke. So no, it ain't. My mother used to drink all the, every weekend, my mother was drinking and drinking and then she could stop you drunk and she lay down and get a little sleep. Then she'd get back up and she start drinking. And just, so if you're wondering why I'm a drinker, it's because my mother, it's her fault. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. The best your genes can do is, is inherit a proclivity for something. But Allah has not clocked it into the genes to be the cause of you doing something as detrimental to your life and to the breakup of your family, Allah doesn't put that in your genes to where you don't even have a choice because your mother was this, your mother used to eat a lot, now that's why you're fat, no, that's wrong. Your mother used to drink a lot, your father used to smoke dope, that's why you smoke dope and you in jail because you were smoking dope and selling dope. It's your father's fault, no it ain't. The proclivity for it. Now, if you keep putting that person in that environment, yeah, they might be more susceptible to developing that particular habit. Yes. But guess what? One generation of absolving yourself from it or separating yourself from it, just one generation. In the next generation that your loins produce will not be that proclivity. You would have erased it. Allah would have erased it. Just one generation, two maximum. One generation of you not doing that negative habit <laughs> will take that out of your system because it's not clocked into your genes. It's clocked into your memes. So that's what habits are. In fact, the DNA has within it a connection to cosmic awareness, as we spoke about earlier, and it exists as part and parcel of the universe's dark matter fabric. So your genetics that are clocked into your biology by Allah, it has a cosmic connection with cosmic DNA that exists as a part of the universe's dark matter space, as it's called in science, black matter space, if you will. In the same way that upwards of 95% of the universe consists of dark matter, listen to this, 95% of our human capabilities are presently unknown. You look at the human being now and you say, how could God have made such a mistake? 
Look at these clowns. Look at these buffoons. Look at these fools. Look at these young people in the neighborhoods acting all crazy, rapping all of these profane lyrics. They can't be a God, or if there's a God, he's sleeping on the job. That's how people think, because they think that they're looking at the end result of Allah's work when they look at that buffoonery, when they look at that tomfoolery, that foolishness, that wastefulness. They, stay, they think that's the human being's potential. No, it's not. Again, in the same way that 95% of the universe is unknown, presently unknown. 95% of the human universe, so to speak, clocked into the DNA also has a 95% ratio of information and potential and possibilities that have not yet been awakened because the season wasn't here. I'm here to tell you the season is now here. That Piscean age, long gone. The age of Aquarius, the water bearer, water represents truth, water represents morality, water represents pure emotional content. That age is here. And as much as they keep trying to strike the artificial match of racism, Black Lives Matter, let's strike that and throw it out there and throw some gasoline on it and watch them burn the cities down. <laughs> this is what you George Soros and these people who fund these artificial organizations this is what they're thinking. We'll just laugh all the way to the bank when they burn down Harlem, you know, when they burn down LA, you know, we'll just laugh all the way to the bank. But they can't get the match lit. Every time they strike, a, a strong wind comes along. <laughs> so who did that? It wasn't me, George. What's going? They can't get it struck. So-called white people are helping so-called black people who are helping so-called Latino people who are helping so-called, you know, all, all of these people are beginning to realize that all of this outward surface stuff, the form of the fitch law, is inconsequential. And what really matters is what's going on within a person's functionality inside. I don't care that he doesn't speak my language. I don't care that she doesn't eat my food. These people are in need of help. I'm going to help them. Even if they're across the waters, I'm going to uh, green. I'm going to find an organization that assists these people in Biafra, Biafra, wherever, Ethiopia, Eritrea. I'm going to find a way to send some money. Or I'm going to be a barefoot doctor and go over there and handle it myself. And these are so-called white people talk. The ones that we're still running around talking about, white man is the devil. You know what I mean? Elijah said, white man is the devil. You didn't understand Elijah's language. So you need to just shut up and listen to us for a change. You need to go back and review some of Imam Muhammad's commentary on his father's teachings and his father's teacher's teacher's teachings. And then come back and we can have a conversation. Absolutely amazing. Let's continue. So that 95% is still unknown. And that's the challenge of the modern day true human. To discover more and more fields of growth and expression and expansion of the human potential that has been lying dormant, waiting for the seasons to change, just like the earth's physical seasons. The growth in the earth has to wait until the seasons are compatible with that growth before you're going to see any foliage, any vegetation, any growth. The cosmos has cosmic seasons, just like the earth has earthly seasons. See? And as far as the cosmos is concerned, it's springtime again. <laughs> and you're going to see all kinds of human excellence springing forth, as you already see. That's why Imam Muhammad had the bold courage enough to say, goodness is on the rise. In the middle of what CNBC and CNN and all of the rest of these rabble rousers are saying about the gloom and doom, the earth might be blown up. We're going to be hit by an asteroid. That's what they want you to believe. 
We want you to believe that Allah is forever and ever in control of what he has created. And he did not create the human life to fail. It can fail, but if it does, it's because it chose failure. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Certainly for sure, we have created the human being in the most excellent of organizational designs. Isn't that wonderful? That's Allah in the Quran speaking. ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ السَّافِلِينَ Thereafter, after much time has passed and accrued and they've bumped their heads and made mistakes and listened to the wrong people and followed the wrong leaders, after that long period of time has passed, we have reduced them to the lowest of the low. And let me tell you something about those two sentences that Allah says that certainly we have accentuated the human being up into the most excellent of organizational designs. Isn't that beautiful? But Allah says thereafter, thumma radadnahu. We have allowed the human being to become debilitated and fall and fail and become a fool until the human being has reached the lowest ebb, the lowest of those things considered low. But Allah doesn't mention the term al-insana in the second part of that expression. In the first part, he mentions al-insana. Al-insana, 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 the human being that I created. I created him in the most excellent of organizational designs. Thereafter, we have reduced it. <laughs> That's what who means. It means him, but it can also mean it. Down to the lowest of the low. So if you begin acting like an it, you can be in that group. If you continue acting like al insan was intended to act as created by Allah, you'll never experience that fall. Continuing. <clears throat> this planet has recently evolved out of the age of Pisces, as I mentioned, and into the age of Aquarius, the water bearer. Now, when I speak on these zodiacal signs, don't think I'm taking you into some new age crap. I'm not. I'm taking you into a new understanding of cosmic phenomenon that has been hidden for us for centuries. People of true knowledge, they understand this language and how to place it accurately within the scope of things. Things that used to be, things to come. People who understand this language can even open up the Quran and show you where each one of these 12 zodiacal signatures exist. I've done it during this class. Just go online, go on YouTube, look up Imam, and, uh, Imam Benjamin Bilal, and just put the word zodiac in there or something like that. <laughs> I've spoken on this multiple times because those 12 signatures are also in you. They're in the Quran under the phrases 12 tribes. They're in the Bible under the title of the 12 disciples. In the Quran, Allah says, strike the rock. Speaking to Moses, Musa, strike the rock. And out came 12 springs. And each tribe knew their place of drinking. That's talking about something happening in you, like what Allah caused to happen out there in the macrocosm. He put the same potential for expression in the microcosm called the human being. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you all for being with us. Got a ton of people on the line tonight. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about 12 you have those same 12 running in you from the top of your cranium, which is Aries, 
all of the way down to the bottom of your two feet, with the, which are the inverted fish that you see in the symbol Pisces. And you have all of them in between. Aries on top, Taurus in your neck. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, what's the sign of the twins again? Gemini. Gemini, yeah. So you got you got Aries, the the ram. <laughs> you got Taurus in the throat, and then you have Aries, the twins. See, that's where they start. The twins, and all of the way down, you got Capricorn in your kneecaps. I'm telling you, it's all there, Sagittarius, all of them, all of the way down from the top of your cranium, all of the way down to your tippy tippy toes. You have those 12 signatures because that's what they were speaking to. They weren't speaking to this mythology that they have sold to the majority of knuckleheaded humans. So we're just trying to bring you out of the knuckleheaded existence into Fiasani Takwim, the most excellent stature. Let's continue. Look at these two pictures, and I know you already see it. Imagine with me for a moment, could this hurricane, also called the cyclone, be indicative of what might be going on in the developing intellect and emotions of this newborn infant? Hmm. I'm establishing a brand new platform for Fitra-based psychology that's going to sweep the entire academic world. And I believe it'll happen in less than three years. This world hasn't been following anything that's Fitra-based. They have been following scholarship that is scholar-based, including the Muslim world. The Muslim world hasn't been following what the Quran calls al fitra trying its best to make sure that the fitra and its concepts do not become corrupted or altered, as Allah says in 3030 in the Quran. That's not what they've been following. They've been following schools of thought. They've been following all kinds of people who purport to be leaders and knowledgeable people in these different areas. And nobody's checking to see if that knowledge corresponds with what Allah put in the fitra. But instructor Benjamin, Bilal has chosen to do that at the inspiration of his own nafs, his own soul has moved him to do this, but at the behest also of our leader, Imam W. Dean Muhammad, because he was almost a purely based fitra connected scholar, meaning most of what he presented, he was giving nature proof for his findings, not scholar proof nature proof. So I continue in that trajectory. I continue in that vein and I'm bringing you nature proof. You're not going to find this when you go to Harvard and Howard and all of these other cowardly institutions that won't teach you the truth, even if they knew it. And I'm not condemning your degrees now. All I'm saying is that Instructor Bilal is about to give you a degree that will put you over and above all of the Masons and the Shriners who went all the way up to, what is it, 33 degrees and then stopped on the most part. What is that? Like just below freezing, 33 degrees. I think freezing is 34 and up, right? Well, they, they let your mind go just beneath freezing because they needed an ice age people to continue running their world. You had to be ice. You couldn't be warm. You had to be ice. It's the Muslims who were supposed to bring the warmth of the sun and they failed. <laughs> they become as cold as ice, even towards each other. You disagree with them, they want to kill you now. Sunni killing Shi'i, killing Ahmadi, killing... <sighs> well, let's see what's going on here in relation to Allah's fitra. So again, imagine with me for a moment. Could this hurricane or cyclone be indicative of what might be going on in the developing intellect and emotions of this newborn infant? Remember, this infant is born instinctive. Instinctive. And then it has to grow to discipline its emotionality, 
to know when to cry legitimately. It has to learn what to laugh at. It doesn't laugh at anything right away. Just because you told a joke, the baby looks at you like a little scientist, like, can I get this under my looking glass? This guy. <laughs> and they're calling Uncle Steven. <laughs> and it's funny to me. I'm trying to figure out how I got here. And you over here trying to moo goo goo guy. I don't want to hear all that right now, Uncle. Whatever an uncle is, <laughs> right? So Allah has placed what I call fitrology in the universe to give the fitra-based mind a jump on the rest of the world of scholarship. All you have to do is begin a cursory study which will lead you to a deep, deep, deep study later on into the comparative analysis of things in the universe that resemble each other in terms of their patterns. It's really that simple. So when you look at this cyclone, it resembles the newborn infant's swirl. They call it now a Fibonacci swirl. Right? Gave credit for Allah's design to some Italian guy, Fibonacci. But nevertheless, it also resembles water going down the drain, doesn't it? Water. Just turn your faucet on and look at the what You got to look at things. Pay attention. It resembles water going down the drain. So it's still dealing with water. Air doesn't go down the drain like that. Not that we can perceive. But water goes down the drain and the cyclone, the cyclone is whipping up the water. And it looks like water going down the drain. And water, according to Imam W.D. Muhammad, as I mentioned earlier, is a symbol of the human being's emotionality. So could it be that because Allah allowed the fitra presentation of the cyclone to resemble the fitra presentation of the newborn infant's hair swirl, where the top layer of brain activity called the neocortex, also mm -hmm. the dormant. Someone has their phone open, hold on. Where the dormant pineal gland is situated, what they call the soft spot. Don't touch the baby, soft spot. That pineal will grow on and go on later in life to become the telephone hookup for that cosmic intelligence we were talking about earlier. When you want to communicate directly with your rub, you do it through the agency of this section of the brain's capacity, which is linked to the so-called third eye. A lot more to be said about that, but I hope you're satisfied with just that little bit and get to studying on your own and bring us back your findings. So the baby is born emotional, instinctive, yes, but emotional. The water goes down the drain seemingly by instinct. It just knows to do that. Every time there's a cyclone, every time there's a hurricane, this is the position that the winds take in terms of the movement of the waters that they affect. Every time, not sometimes, every time. Allah clocked it into his fitra and Allah said, do not alter his fitra. Make no alterations on his fitra. What is he saying? Don't separate what I have placed as fitra pattern phenomenon in the universe. Don't look at that pattern and then start inventing other ideas for things that I created with the same or similar design. Don't you know that most of the fruits and vegetables that are good for your body resemble those parts of the body that they're good for? You've seen those charts, I'm sure. You slice a carrot open, it looks like the eye, the retina. And it turns out that carrots are good for you. You didn't need a scholar to tell you that if you were paying attention to Allah's fitrah. Man, oh man. So we say, hmm, could the keys for understanding infant psychology and what's going on in the infant's mind that we can't read, but can we read Allah's signs in nature, his ayat? Can we read that? Enough to evoke a curiosity 
that will stimulate the intuitive possibilities in the brain that are beginning to develop in that infant. From that instinctive behavior, it's going to produce a elementary level intuition. And I told you intuition is connected to the term nas, which is connected to the term nose, which is connected to the idea of intuition. And Musa said, and nas to nar, I perceive a fire. Where was he perceiving that fire? He was perceiving it intuitively. That was the superficial intuition that every child is born into. So Musa leaving his family and going down into the valley is a progression that could have taken a lifetime and not necessarily a singular event. Just imagine with me for a moment. By the time he gets down into the valley, he has went through certain life experiences and circumstances which have now qualified him to come into the greater intuition called the supra intuition in my language. And what was the name of that valley that Musa stepped into? It was called the Tua. Can you see the connection? Tua, to it, into it, intuition. See, you think the graduation is that way. Allah is showing you that the graduation is this way. You think it's this way, the pyramid you masons and shriners, you. Allah is saying, no, your true graduation is this way. Looks like the vagina and its opening possibilities. <laughs> it's the V formation, like the birds make when they fly. It's not your pyramid foundation or elevation. It's the V formation. Man, oh man. <laughs> so could it be that within the infant's growing mind and growing and evolving possibilities, that quick growth that's taking place in the infant and then in the toddler and then in the teenager, that's quick, especially between birth and seven, man, that growth is quick. Accelerated by Allah, Rabbi al the evolver of all systems of knowledge. That's what he's doing here. So if this is related to water and water is related to emotions and moral decision-making, see, morals keep you clean. The baby loves to be cleaned up. It loves to make a mess too now, don't get me wrong. But when you finally bathe that baby and put that little scented, whatever that is, and the smell and smell the baby's neck and all of that stuff that the mothers be talking about. Man, what a pleasure that is to the human nose. Oh, this baby smells so fresh. Like it's just out the garden. It is. So what is there to learn about human emotionality by studying the pattern, not by opening up this baby's head and examining it for some adrenochrome chemical, you freaks, you murderers. They'll take an infant like this and cut his head open in some kind of ritualistic madman's ritual and drink the blood that surrounds the pineal. It's called adrenochrome. Study it if you have the stomach. And they believe that gives them some kind of supernatural power. The power that's in the baby's ability to grow at that rate of speed and to learn things, new things. These old fuddy-duddy uh, 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 murderers is what they are. They believe in sacrificing children. This has been thousands of years. This is not just yesterday that they've been doing this. Thousands of years they've had these rituals. And Allah is about to put an end to all of it. Trust me when I tell you that. Child molestation, child abduction. You think these things are going to continue to go on now that we're living in the day of what's called judgment in the Quran? No, Allah is about to bring it into all of this. He's about to embarrass a whole lot of people that, who, whose names you know and have known. Some of whom are telling on this themselves. 
but that's a subject for another day. Not going to end today <laughs> with that on your brain. Don't want you to go to sleep on that, but I don't want you to go to sleep, period. So we want to think about that. If you're a psychology student like I am, we're going to be establishing a separate school just to study FITRA-based psychology. My first book on this is called a, uh, The Psychology of the Soul. You need to get it if you don't have it. The Psychology of the Soul. It's a series. And I'm about to put out book two and three simultaneously. Now, what I'm going to do in the interest of time is stop. I've got plenty for you, as you can imagine, but we're going to do this incrementally. And we don't want to overburden or inundate anyone, especially new people. But I think I've said enough to convince you, if you're a new person, that you need to stay on this train as it rolls down the track, because the doors to this train are not going to be open forever. So find out what it takes. In fact, I'm going to put a number here. Find out what it takes to become a permanent member of the university online learning course. And uh, you can call 516-300-2257. But better than that, just email us at Nunetics Institute Incorporated. The email address is, oh, I'm sorry. Oops, trying to type on a high table. Cosmic Quran one at gmail.com. Small c here. Okay. And that's the email that you use to connect with me. And I'll give you all of the particulars if you haven't received them yet on how you can become a permanent registered member of the university online learning course. So as we go into semester number 20, uh, you'll be fully equipped to follow us. I would be incrementally giving you information designed to help you catch up to where we are, which many people have done coming in late in the game, so to speak. And I also will be giving you personal one-on-one -on -one tutelage so that I know what you know, and then I know where you need to go from where you are with what you know. So you will not get lost in the sauce joining this course going into the 20th semester. You won't get lost, trust me. Everybody who's joined us in the last few years, I don't remember anybody falling off, maybe one or two people, but not because they didn't understand the information. And I'm also going to be having a series of deliveries, books, uh, webinars, what you call podcasts, which we're going to be calling seed casts <laughs> on our new seed cast uh, endeavor. I'm going to ask William Saf here to rejoin us and give you about two or three minutes worth of what that's going to be about. You are also going to have an opportunity to host your own seed cast uh, programs. William will also tell you about that. Nothing in detail, but just enough to whet your whistle. I've already got certain people earmarked for that. And that's going to begin fresh and new in January 2023. So stay tuned for that. So with that said, I'm not going to entertain any questions for the night. That's going to take up too much time. I think it's a miracle that I've gotten through just a little bit after 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'm going to uh, appreciate that and uh, allow William to say, please don't disappear. You need to hear what he's going to say allow him to say what it is he's going to say. And there's going to be a lot of good energy and activity and frequencies coming at you, especially what well, you feel them tonight, but they're going to continue into 2023. And they're going to do so no holes barred. We're going to be on a different platform other than YouTube. So if you don't get with us during December, you might not know where to find us. We'll be on rumble.com, but still, you have to have an invitation to get in there. You can't just go to Rumble on a Sunday night and think you're going to find us and just join us. I'm really not interested in any more passive participation. I'm interested in people who want to study, people who I can call up and say, you know, give me that homework question. Give me the answer to that homework question I gave you. Or if you don't know the answer, do you have 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes out of your busy day, out of your busy week for me to explain it to you? So now you got it. 
and you have no excuses for not knowing this. This information is life-saving, literally life-saving. If you don't recognize that now, you will in just a couple of months because they plan on shaking up this world in a way that will make you think that they are God. When you can't find food and you will think that anybody who hands you a loaf of bread is God if you're not firmly grounded in who Allah actually is. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm doing what Allah charged the prophets with, bringing good news and warning. They're good news bearers, but they are also warners. I'm not a prophet as such, not on that level, but on my little itty bitty human level, in fact, all of us have been charged with that responsibility to bring good news, but to also recognize when people need to be warned against the certain, certain kinds of behaviors that's going to take them into the hellfire. You're not supposed to sit zipped lipped and not say anything about people who are clearly begging to be thrown into the fire, but don't realize it. We're supposed to speak to those concerns. So everything is not going to be goody, goody, la, la, di, da. Everything is nice. Goodness is on the rise. That's not what next semester is going to be about. It's going to be about you taking advantage as quickly as you can of the advice and the guidance that I give you and that I bring to you from other people who are knowledgeable in these areas. I'm talking about mere, not just mere, your very survival is at stake when you understand what the scheme is. All of it is in the Quran. But the end result of it is in the Quran also. For those people who follow the Hudan, the guidance, Allah says, all other people, pff, you've consigned yourself to hell because you keep listening to that thing in you, that jinn in you, that iblis in you, that shaitan in you that you thought had better advice than Allah's word. So now you have to suffer the consequences. We're sick now on the most part for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Diabetes, high blood pressure, all of that reversible stuff, killing us, taking us off of the planet, our fork and knife taking us off of the planet. You want to continue to live like that, keep doing what you're doing. You want to change the trajectory of your life, stick with what we're doing because again, this represents life-giving. You thought the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings were life-giving teachings? These are the true life-giving teachings because we're giving life to more than just your biology. We're giving life to you to the point where you can support your evolution into pineal gland activation and super intuitive cognition awareness, realigning yourself with cosmic awareness. To where all you have to do is sit, do what the Quran says do, do the real dhikr, do the real salat, which I'm going to be introducing in detail. We're going, to be we're going to be doing it online. As you watch me, I'm going to say, do this, say this, do that. And now go on your own, in your own closet, or wherever you go for prayer and do it for yourself. And then come back to us the week after, two weeks after, a month after, and tell us if it's not, if it's not working for you, it's because you ain't doing it. I'm telling you what I know. This is not guesswork. This is Allah's work. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So thank you for joining me as I invite our brother and fellow instructor, William Safir back into the conversation. Yes, uh, this is- Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, this is probably the most exciting time that uh, uh, for human beings uh, to be alive in. So learners, instructors, senior instructors, senior executive instructors, uh, it's time to get busy. Uh, if you notice in, in the background, like I shared before we got started, uh, instructor. Yes. Mm -hmm. I and I, we've been busy. You can see we were working on some recordings earlier. Uh, well, Glad to see that. It looks Did I accidentally good. silence you? Everyone else other than William Safir should be muted. William, I'm sorry, I think Something I asked. happened. Okay. Everyone else, Shafika, everyone else, Abdullah, everybody, keep your phones muted. And after William is finished saying what he's saying, I'll give you a moment to say what it is you need to say. 
but we need uh, silence to hear what he's saying. Thank you. Uh, yes, as I was saying, this is this is in a very exciting time. Uh, Fida and I, we were recording uh, our, our first seed cast, as you see on the notes behind me here. And we got so engaged in it after we finished our, our, our first uh, episode, uh, we just kept building on the information numerically. And you see, we filled up a whole board, filled up a whole board there. Uh, so that's laying the foundation for episodes to come in the future. And with this kind of thing, no matter what your interest is, uh, instructors, is it, 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 uh, it'll be nunetics regardless how you express it. You know, it, it can be in uh, science, it can be in math, it can be in, in, in the social sciences. It doesn't matter. Whatever interest you have, it, uh, uh, the particular one that I'm working on right now has to do with uh, finance. Uh, building generational wealth for families, you know, uh, and so that's the kind of information I'm putting out, but I'm putting it out using nunetics a as a means of, of having it in line with where the world is, where, where the cosmos is, and, and where we're directed right now. So get busy, get busy, uh, and whatever that means for you, uh, of course, the instructors are uh, uh, available, I'm available as well, uh, but we're moving into a new season coming into 2023. Uh, you, you can uh, prepare uh, whatever kind of materials you're comfortable with. It could be books, it could be ebooks, it could be courses, it could be just articles, but it's time to get busy. It could be a podcast, we're calling it Seedcast, uh, but we will, in the very near future, a uh, very near future, uh, we will be, uh, uh, we will be, uh, putting into motion our own platform uh, where we'll be uh, uh, protected and secured and you can participate on that. So get ready. Uh, the time is now, you know, the time is around. Uh, there, there's some information. Uh, you can refer to uh, Pat Flynn. Uh, uh, he's he's uh, specialized in, in, in establishing podcasts. Uh, he give you some information on some things you can think Think about doing some things you can actually do to, to get the ball rolling. But uh, the most important thing is don't wait. Get on it and get on it now. Uh, and uh, well, uh, again, the most important thing is wherever you're comfortable, you know, you can start and you can share that with the world. And as you do that, you will be contributing to the forward movement of the Nunetics Institute and what we're doing, not only here locally, but globally. I leave anything out, instructor? Uh, no, just to expound upon that or expand on that for a moment. Um, okay. I, I've already identified, and I think I put it in an email, I have identified maybe about uh, seven to 10 of the instructors, particularly if you've already reached the status of senior instructor or executive senior instructor, you're going to be a part of this next uh, phase going into semester number 20. So be prepared to meet with me as a smaller group of instructors, and I'm going to be giving you your marching orders from there. We're going to have a number of seed cast programs taking place simultaneously that most of you will be hosts of. Sometimes you'll be partnered with me. Sometimes you'll be partnered with William Safir or Adib Abdullah. Sometimes you'll be out there on your own. Myself and Mikhail Abdul Samad, we're going to have our own podcast dealing specifically and strictly with the language and logic of W.D. Muhammad coming straight from his language from 1975 to 2008. Ramadan sessions, all of what the people didn't understand when he was delivering it, we're going to make it crystal clear as to the language, the choice of words he used, the ayat and surahs from the Quran that he was referencing. But we're going to go deep, deep, deep into the rabbit hole of his language and logic. There won't be anything surface oriented about that approach. So that'll be one of the things we're doing. But you might be someone who your main thing might be that you know how to cook. Now, cooking might not have anything to do with pneumatics, but we need a good uh, Muslim chef or, or cook to show us how to, uh, how to eat again. We don't even know how to eat anymore like we did. Even in the nation of Islam days, we knew what to put in our mouths. 
Now we put just about anything in our mouths because we don't know how to cook. Many of our younger people, male and female, they don't know what to do with the kitchen. They only know Pizza Hut and, you know, going out and Golden Corral. And we've lost the art and the science of preparing our own food. Which one of you singularly or together can get together and say, I'm going to show you and I'm going to get a camera set up in my home. You can do it with your cell phone camera. And I'm going to show step by step how to make this particular meal. People are doing that all over the all over YouTube, all over the world. They're doing that. Italian chefs and Mexican chefs and African chefs. Where's our presence in that? The halal way. Where's that? That's what I'm talking about. So we're going to be doing a whole lot of things that are considered activity. This will not be a passive thing that we do starting in next semester. So don't look to be in the bleachers as we do all of the work. If you don't agree to be a part of the work, don't pay your tuition. I'm telling you now, I'll give it, I, I'm not going to give it back to you. If you pay it, I'm not giving it back to you. But I will limit your participation. If you limit your participation, you have to be a doer, not just a believer. Let me, let me share this too, because it came to mind as you were, as you were talking. One of the things that, that, that uh, will eliminate some of the hesitation and the fear, you, you don't have to do all of the talking and all of the thinking. You can just be the person you've been in this experience, this genetics experience. You can have guests on, on, on your seed cast. There you go. And you can just uh, arrange questions and where you can guide the conversation numerically. But you can draw out of them and they can provide all the uh, all the detailed information. You just have to kind of lead the way. And you don't even have to be on camera. Some That's people true. don't like their camera presence. Just be a voice. Yeah. There are many people who have successful million dollar podcasts who I don't know what they look like. But I know their voices because I'm used to their voices every week. So we're not forcing you to do anything that you would not normally do on your own. If you talk to people ordinarily, you should be able to talk to people in cyberspace or wherever that's coming from. So, or you might be the kind of person like a Bayina Hamid. Look at the excellent research that she does. She goes off way beyond the call of duty when it comes to uh, researching words and concepts and areas of the internet that I speak on. So why wouldn't you partner with her to have her be your primary research person in the area that you're good at being on the camera and on the, you know having your face recognition, but you're not a good researcher? Why don't you partner with Bayina, who can bring you back the proper information? Your That's co-hosting your is big. Co-hosting is real big. Oh man. Yeah. 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 All right. So I'm I am going to allow for just a couple of uh, comments or questions, mostly comments or greetings. And then we'll close out since we did end uh, quite early. So if there's anyone who wants to say, uh, give greetings or ask a quick question or make a quick comment, this would be the time to do so. I see Judith's phone open. Are you yes. on? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Um, good to see you. I, I haven't seen you in, in a while. I know. <laughs> yeah. A lot have been going on, but uh, yes, uh, I always watch the video back. Good. Yeah, I I agree with the gentleman. I for I, I don't know the name. He was speaking here, and um, um I was doing natural products before I even uh, um happened to know your instruction, and uh, it was really tough for me. Uh, but since I really have to, uh, since I started listening to you, I do have a way to connect things now okay yeah but i'm still struggle but mm -hmm. um is a very good way neonetics <clears throat> the way that i end up connecting things so it's something for me it's really really tough but i'm really walking slowly good but uh, i can tell you it's something really really big in my life okay. in so many angles well, then you might be the one, uh, one of the people who end up with your own seed cast program. <laughs> true, advertise. true. Yes. Yeah, why not? So you can mm -hmm. advertise what it is you're doing. And uh, I, okay. That's what you're for. 
Right, I do natural products. And then when I say natural products, skin products and uh, tea. I make, um, I'm into tea, a lot of tea. Why? Because um, I try to bring things way back the way we were using in my country in the form of natural products. So that's what I'm based, that's what I've been doing here. And um, I, I want people to know what's meaning, what's the, what's the difference between natural and organic. Mm. Yes, yes, because um, the moment you say organic, it's already mix of something. The process is not natural. Mm. That's the word organic comes. Because I, I did a lot of research about organic when I came in America. Where I come from, we don't use a word organic. Everything is natural or is something else. So those are the thing I was really trying to put it together. Now, for instance, if I give you Moringa tea, for me to say this is Moringa, natural Moringa, meaning since the beginning, since the process from the tree being plant, if for like the process is completely natural, whereby um, we don't use any fertilizer. And if we do, we use natural fertilizer. You understand? Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to say. Like, um, I'm working on the natural products. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a point person mm -hmm. <clears throat> from the class of uh, executive ex instructors who's going to be the person that you communicate with. Mm -hmm. And you're going okay. to give them yes. all of the details of what it is you're working on and who mm -hmm. you'd like to work with and decide, we'll decide then whether it's something that fits into the, the, the first stages of what we're trying to format as seed posting possibilities. It might be that in the beginning of this, it's just that you're the guest mm -hmm. on a particular person's program, you see? Okay. And you might be the guest maybe twice a week. You know, mm -hmm. twice a week, mm -hmm. people are going to look forward to having Judith on the, on the program because everybody wants to know now what this difference is between natural and organic and where do I mm -hmm. get it? How do I grow it? And those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And I know other people such as uh, Fatima Muhammad and a few others, um, Habiba mm -hmm. and others who have connections to people who are doing their best to do what you're talking about doing. But you just mm -hmm. opened up a wormhole. You probably know that because a lot of us are used to running out to the the natural uh, supermarkets and the first thing we see that has organic on it two things are going to happen we're going to buy it and it's going to cost mm -hmm. us more <laughs> we're yeah. we're already used to being charged more just because they put the word organic on it you know and oh. uh, this is mm -hmm. a part of the manipulator's language we know that uh mm -hmm. so we have to be very careful but we will invite you to mm -hmm. share that information uh, maybe uh, I'm sure before January comes in, I'm going to have you probably in a smaller group of us, uh, yes, communicate with people who have that same interest. So remind me of that. Okay. And, and okay. we'll get you, we'll get you started. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you, dear. I saw oh, Shafika. Yes. I don't know if she wanted to say something or not. Is she still with us? Shafika? Open up your phone. Where is she? Okay, if she's not there, I see Waliu Dean. Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you. Got to get some better um, lighting, man. Yeah, I'm trying to get to this uh, better light. <laughs> you can't be looking that cool and you ain't got no good lighting. Uh, man. Uh, let me see. Oh, I'm getting left. Yes, All right, light a candle or something. Yeah. Make sure it's you. All right, go ahead. Okay, salam alaikum. I just wanted to give you the greetings, give the, uh, everyone the greetings, and I. Uh, I know that there are two, at least two new uh, learners on the line. And um, if you would um, just share with them, particular the uh, book list, particular the books that almost a must, like the Nunetics, uh, uh, the book, so that they uh, know that this is a journey and um, 
I mean, we are truly enjoying uh, what we are digesting and ingesting to take us to new levels. So uh -huh. uh, I'm, I'm uh, here with uh, a young brother, Nate Powell. Uh -huh. who, uh, this is his first experience. Yeah. I know Great. I was, um, I saw um, uh, Tahita on the line uh, as well, uh, probably the second time she's been on. And uh, so I just wanted to welcome them uh, to this learning experience and just um, dive in because we are in for awesome ride. That's great. That's great. Okay. So what I'm going to do is uh, <clears throat> very quickly give you some of the names of the 19 books that I've written so that uh, when you receive my book list, you'll have a better idea of, of what the priority books are. <clears throat> So the number one book, of course, is Nunetics, and that's Insights into the Nature-Based Meanings of Arabic Letters. Now, that book is designed to help you read the Quran better if you're reading the Quran. And if you're wanting to read the Quran in Arabic, but you don't know Arabic, you're not familiar with the letter system and that kind of thing, because we're going to give you Arabic letters, but we're going to give you a meaning for each letter. It won't be how they teach you Arabic in the masjid or Arabic class they're going to begin you with root words we begin you with seed letters and there's a big difference it's like being a farmer and somebody bringing you roots and say here regrow this in your garden as opposed to somebody bringing you seeds and saying these are yours and you know what they are this one is for the lemon trees this one is for the watermelon patch this one is for the orange grove when you get the seeds you know what that's going to be same thing with language when you get seed letters and you know what that seed letter is you know what you're growing in terms of the language that you're learning. But if somebody just tells you what that is, like this word in Arabic means this, the other word means that, how do you know? Where's your proof for that when you don't have the seed information? So Nunetics is the number one book. <clears throat> the next book is The N-Word. And I'm only going to recommend three books right now. The N-Word, Curious Insights into the Corruption of Fundamental Meanings in the English Letter System. So the N-word does for the English alphabet what Nunetics does for the Arabic alphabet. And I show you where every single one of the 26 English letters come from off of the walls of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Not from the Hebrew language, not from the ancient Phoenicians. Those are people who borrowed the knowledge and never gave it back claimed it for themselves but when you go into those walls yourself you can see without using a rosetta stone that this means this means that means that and you'll see it very clearly when i explain it to you through the book called the n-word all right and um the next book i would recommend is called the nature of life if you're not a muslim especially this is the perfect book for you. The Nature of Life, a very beautifully written book. It'll touch your soul as you read it. If you're married, I want to recommend The Etymology of Marriage. So that'll be the fourth book that I recommend. If you're married, male or female, The Etymology of Marriage, meaning the terms, the popular terms that are used in the system that we call marriage, are terms that are manipulative terms. And it actually reduces the female down to a workhorse. When they call you a bride, it's a reference to the bridal <laughs> strap of the horse. See, and there's a lot of other things that I can talk about. When they call him the groom, it's just a reference to the person who grooms the horse. And the horse is always corralled and prepared for work, for working in the field, for running in the races, that kind of thing. And that's exactly what they've been using women for. I'm sorry, speaking of women, I have to recommend one other book. It's called Beating the Women. Is that really in the Quran? <coughs> See? So uh, just uh, make sure that I get your email addresses. Any new people, make sure I get your email addresses. And I will send you out the complete book list and how to order those books. Okay. I see another person here with their phone open. Thank you. It is. Thank you. Thank you for that. And what are their names, uh, Wally? 
Okay, Nate Powell is here. Nate and, Powell, uh, he's there physically Nate with Powell. you? Nate Powell, yeah, he's physically Let here. Let him step into the camera. Give me the camera, man. <laughs> Come on, it's almost like I, like I got the OJs over there. Find one more brother, man. I got the OJs. <laughs> yeah, man. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam, Nate Powell. How are you, sir? Man, I'm wonderful, man. Good. Yes, yeah, how you doing? I'm pretty well. I'm sorry I had to to, to have your first experience be this kind of high-level <laughs> uh, oh. intro, but you look like you can handle that. <laughs> yeah, you can handle it. Hey, man, I'm strapping up, you know? I hear you. Yes, sir. I hear you. Your face is lit up, man. I got to talk yeah. to you one-on-one -on -one now. Yeah. I'm getting locked. All yes, right. Sir. But stick and, and stay, uh, man. Just just stay in the loop. Yeah. yeah. And right. I, Tahita uh, Hassan was on earlier. She may still be on. If if you're on, Tahita, come in the camera. This is great. This is wonderful. So, Wally, you let me know who these people are, and I'm going to send them new netics for free. It'll be complimentary. Alhamdulillah. All right. They can purchase any of the other books, but I'm going to send them new netics. Uh, uh, um, an autographed copy of New Netics for their library. Alhamdulillah. God bless you. All right. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Shukran. Okay. So is there anyone else on who, who needed to say something? Alaikum salam. Muhammad. Yeah, Muhammad alam Ali. Just to say that listening to you, uh, what you're talking about was scientifically sound and I'm saying this because I taught science and I, 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 it's very, it was very clear. And, and the other thing is that pneumatics, because of the way it is structured within the fitra, whatever, whatever level of knowledge that you're on or that you study is compatible with, with, with the knowledge in general. And that's the, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. You know, you can, it can be chemistry, it can be mathematics, it can be science, it can be whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's a compatibility mm -hmm. and it's going to open up another bright, uh, area of understanding. Thank you. And you're a professional educator, so I, I, I trust your word. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. Bayina, you wanted to say something? I want to give everyone the salams. And uh, I just want to thank you for sharing your Taurus Bill energies with us and keeping things balanced. Thank you. All right. I'll, be look I'll be looking for you a lot next semester, and I know you already know that. So thank you. All right. Anyone else before we close out? Yahya Hassan. Alaikum salam. Alhamdulillah. I just want to say I'm enjoying the class and I'm enjoying right. myself using this new netics on everybody I meet. Yeah, yeah. So you, you know it's time for us to talk again because I got oh, a, yeah. I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of duties for you to, to carry out. Well, alhamdulillah, I think I'm ready. I know you're ready. <laughs> I wouldn't call on a person if I didn't think they were ready. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All right. Great, great, great. I see Yahya Hassan up there. I don't see a microphone for him, though. No. I don't know if he's able to speak. But if anyone else wants to say something, this will be the time. You got about two minutes left to jump in. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Um, assalamu alaikum to everyone. Um, I, I apologize. I was at work and I, I just tuned in maybe about 20 minutes ago and caught the intel of everything. Um, but I did you know, uh, got the email for the seed cast. And my question is, if you already have a YouTube channel, are you, is it a good idea, you know, when the time come for us to do the seed cast to do it from our personal YouTube channel? Yeah, you can do that. We can be linked to YouTube. And also I'm going to have a, um, a website also the 1st of January, it, that will be up and running. So you'll be able to link also to the website. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it'll be a Nunetics Institute website that uh, one of our daughters designed and that one of our sons is going to help me manage. So I'm taking on more people, which means I need more assistance from all of you, financial and otherwise, because this has to grow. It's a seed itself and it has to grow. So uh, any website that you're already dealing with, you could be selling jewelry, you could be selling clothing, you could be selling it doesn't have to be related to Nunetics. If you want presence on the Nunetics Institute website, all you have to do is let me know. You sell any books, doesn't even have to be your books. Some people resell books and do very well. So here's where all of the talk stops and the action begins. Yes, indeed. So all right. Instructing. Yes, sir. I, uh, the, 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 uh, 
Fitrology. Fitrology. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, alhamdulillah. And, uh, um, uh, it got me excited and uh, to, to uh, add, add to that, that field. I know you will. You first on my list. Fitrology. Yes, that's beautiful. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I'm going to take that as an indication that uh, Fida is the last person speaking. So we can close out now. Give me a chance for this to cook, and it'll be up on YouTube. One of the last that'll be up on YouTube. Whatever we do not do in December will not go up on YouTube. So make sure your participation is what it's supposed to be. Um, also, those people who register early for semester number 20, you know, the... Um, the tuition for that is $300 per semester. Each semester lasts for three months. And December is the last month of semester 19. So a fresh new semester will be beginning in January. If you pay in advance, meaning between now and December 25, <clears throat> no connection to the ho, ho, ho. <laughs> but, but if you know, no, no, what I know, you'll get your... Uh, tuition in for $75 off. If it's after the 25th, you got to go chase Santa Claus because it'll be back to $300. All right. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you know, I'm going to be doing some teaching on Santa Claus and the Christmas spirit before all is said and done in December. And reindeer. All right. Yeah. All right, Abdullah, you're looking good there, man, but you need some more lighting too. I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to, I'm going to teach a whole webinar on how to do proper lighting for, for, uh, for a webinar and for a podcast because people need to be able to see your bright smiling faces, but I didn't know it until somebody told me and taught me the same thing. I look at my old webcast and my old webinars and I'm like, Oh, who is that guy? Cause I can hardly see me. But we're going to have, it's a, it's a simple process. You don't need to go out and spend a whole lot of money on lighting and all that kind of stuff. It's basically where your lights are, are placed that creates the difference. And a lot of you have lights behind you. So whatever's behind you is well lit. I like that dresser and that, you know, that lamp, but I can't see you. So you have to learn how to put those lights in front of you or to the sides of you so that you can have the best lighting. We'll learn all of that. All of that is a part of the learning process. All right. Got to go, got to go, got to go. Thank you very much for being a part of this learning experience. University online learning course on this fourth day of December 2022. I am your international instructor, Benjamin Bilal, and I'll be looking for you for as long as you're looking for me because I love this experience. So thank you all for being with me as I greet you in the greetings of peace that obligate each and every one of us to keep the peace. What is that greeting? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. To you all, I appreciate you so much. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Arlene. Assalamu alaikum. Bill of Peace, I see you, Sharif. Wonderful people, Amina. Great, great, great energy on this line. I'm telling you, boy, what's going to happen between now and next year is going to be phenomenal. So as they say, stick and stay. Assalamu alaikum.